how do you figure out whether you have mild insulin resistance, a lot of insulin resistance, if you're at risk of insulin resistance? Well, this is actually part of the problem. There isn't a generally accepted and accessible test for insulin resistance. Clinically, we use metabolic consequences uh, as a markers as markers to see whether you are likely to have insulin resistance. Um, so when we diagnose metabolic syndrome, we're looking at impaired glucose uh, tolerance tests. We're looking at uh, obesity that we measure through various means. We used to use BMI. We're moving more towards a, a very quick uh, tool called waist to hip ratio that you can do at home. Um, we look at your lipid profile and particular um, the ratio of HDL to triglycerides, um, which are which you can uh, get on, on most uh, lipid panels um, and the presence of uh, high blood pressure as well and, and the presence of high elevated triglycerides. So in the UK, we're looking at uh, a waist circumference of over 102 centimeters for men or over 88 centimeters for women. Or if you want to look specifically at the waist hip ratio, you want it to be 0, 0 0.85 or less for women and 0 0.9 or less for men. Um, to do your waist hip ratio is very simple. I would go on YouTube and look at the methodology because you want to do it in between the bottom of your rib and the top of the iliac crest. The midpoint between there is where you do you, one measurement and then you do the other measurement at the largest point around your buttocks, essentially. So, and you want to make sure that the waist to hip ratio is uh, sub those levels. Very, very simple test to do, but again, full of inaccuracies and that alone is not enough to tell whether you are insulin resistant or insulin sensitive or not. In it's, it's all a combination of all these different markers, all these different investigations that we have that would enable a clinician to essentially pull up a red flag or an amber flag as to whether you are heading in the wrong metabolic direction. But it is definitely part of the problem because as we're going to the actual gold standard of uh, measuring insulin resistance, it's, um, it's very difficult. Um, Raised triglycerides, so over 1.7 millimoles per liter. Those are things that we, we want to be careful of. Uh, reduced uh, HDL cholesterol. So HDL is high-density lipoproteins. These are taxis that ferry cholesterol around your body. Nothing. It's not a new type of cholesterol. It's not a different type of cholesterol. HDL cholesterol is the type of protein that ferries the same cholesterol that everyone has around the body um, back to the liver where it can be reprocessed. Um, so we want to make sure that we've got uh, higher amounts of this HDL cholesterol in the context of uh, uh, low triglycerides as well. Uh, raised blood pressure. So we want to be looking at no more than 130 over 85. Those are the cutoffs for the UK. Although there is a, a trend towards uh, less is better, obviously not too low. Um, and then fasting uh, plasma glucose. This, I think, even though in the context of all those different... Um, test is important it's it's quite a late stage indicator of insulin resistance so you really want to be uh looking at other markers of insulin resistance rather than just an oral glucose tolerance test or just a fasting plasma glucose because as we know insulin resistance precedes any issues with diabetes by up to 10 to 15 years so th this is why we want to we want to get on on top of um uh, insulin resistance in research, the gold standard is something called the euglycemic clamp, also known as the hyperinsulinemic clamp. It's a research technique with limited clinical ability uh, applicability. Uh, euglycemic being you normal or good glycemic, as you know now, glucose in the blood, or hyperinsulinemic. This points to it, it's also known as this. This points to the the method used. Uh, in, in the technique where you basically pump a high amount of um, exogenous, so outside of the body insulin into the body to switch off the gluco, glucose production in the liver. So you're just relying on the glucose that one is uh, delivering to the body. I'll, I'll explain the, uh, the technique. So picture uh, insulin being infused into one vein uh, in, in a person who's, who's lying on a couch. Um, and the idea is to reach a constant level of uh, insulin in the blood. And since insulin is being pumped into this person, what's going to happen? It's going to 
plummet your glucose. So in the, at the same time, you also have to have another infusion of glucose and you vary the rate of that glucose infusion to reach euglycemia. Euglycemia being a normal level of glucose in the blood. And the, the way we measure that is in another uh, uh, cannula that we put into the back of the hand, we'll be taking measurements of the blood glucose level to make sure that we're getting it to a stable level. At the point whereby you are simultaneously giving glucose infused at a varying rate until it stabilizes the sugar level to a normal level, because you've got a constant level of insulin also going in. At that point, that equals the amount that is being taken up by the body's tissues, which is a, a direct measure of how sensitive those tissues are to insulin. The more glucose that needs to be infused to keep that steady state of euglycemia, the more is being taken up by the body, which means that the tissue is more sensitive to insulin. So how do I explain this? The more insulin is driving glucose into your target cells, the lower your blood glucose is going to be. So if you have to infuse more glucose to maintain a steady state, that means your insulin is doing, the insulin is doing a good job and you're sensitive to the insulin that is being pumped into your body at a steady state. It is a research technique. It is not something that we use in uh, clinical um, uh, environments, um, but it is very useful when it comes to uh, the, the research side of things. There are a bunch of issues with this technique, however. It takes a few hours to do. It's relatively expensive, even for research standards. And across the literature, there are varying rates of the insulin infusions that we use. So some people use 40 mils. Uh, some people use 120 mils per, per, per hour. Glucose infusions are different. They're varying uh, ways in which you can measure the sensitivity of uh, insulin sensitivity as well. They use something called glucose disposal rate. And that's often expressed as a function of body weight, which makes it very hard to compare across individual studies. If you're just doing it by weight, then you know how do you categorize one group of patients that are obese versus lean? It, it, it can get very, very complicated. I don't think anyone's going to be doing a euglycemic clamp anytime soon uh, in clinic. So there are some surrogate markers of insulin resistance that you can do in clinic. Only requires a single blood draw, relatively inexpensive to do. Not 100% accurate, but they are useful. So something called the HOMA IR, that's Homeostatic Model Assessment of Insulin Resistance, HOMA IR. It's a mathematical calculation used to estimate, and I hasten to use the word estimate, insulin resistance based on fasting glucose and fasting insulin levels that you can have measured. It's a simple formula. You times those two together over 22.5. Um, values greater than 2.5 are suggestive of insulin resistance over 5.5 or over six is very sensitive to insulin resistance um, but you'd have to really be pushing the uh the, the, the those values to, to get to that number and by that time it's more than likely that you have all the symptoms or all the diagnoses that are related to insulin resistance. So the value of HOMA IR, I don't think is uh, proven out. There are a few others, there's quick eye. These are all uh, mathematical equations that um, use single blood draws to estimate the, the sensitivity, sorry, to estimate insulin resistance. Uh, there are a couple of studies that have compared the surrogate markers of insulin resistance to euglycemic clamps. Um, with okay sensitivity and specificity. Um, I think overall, there are going to be other uh, markers that we should be looking at to estimate insulin resistance. There are also things called uh, insulin resistance in indexes, uh, like Matsuda, the gut index, uh, the Macaulay index. These are beyond the scope of today's discussion. We're not really going to go into the pros and cons of those, but they, there are some markers that can point you in the direction of whether you are insulin resistant or not. I honestly go for the metabolic markers that we discussed earlier. So things like blood pressure, triglyceride, tr triglycerides, uh, the triglyceride HDLC ratio, blood pressure, uh, fasting glucose. The more accessible tests 
that I believe most people would be able to uh, get hold of would be a fasting glucose. Although, like I explained, it's quite a late measure. Um, we want to be looking at no more than um, uh, or 3.9 to 5.5 millimoles per liter. Uh, for the Americans, you can use a calculator to uh, to change that. I believe it's 70 to around 99 mill milligrams per deciliter. Uh, those can those can indicate impaired insulin function and insulin resistance. But again, it's not. It's a very late stage, in my opinion. Um, there is a blood test uh, called fasting insulin, where you actually measure fasting insulin levels. Um, so it's it typically done overnight. Um, uh, you fast overnight and then you do it first thing in the morning. Um, but this is very hard to interpret. The range of it is very wide. And we usually reserve this kind of test for diagnosing uh, things like insulinomas, which are tumors uh, of the pancreatic gland where you have very, very high amounts of insulin. Um, and you're really looking for a, a cause as to why someone is presenting with very, very low levels of glucose um, and other endocrine disorders. So that's the clinical application of that test. I personally don't think it has much um, uh, use in, in clinical medicine, apart from perhaps uh, being used to calculate HOMA IR. IR. Um, it's HbA1c, which again, I think, is a very late stage. So by the time you see changes in uh, uh, hemoglobin HbA1, uh, uh, hemoglobin A1c, it's quite late. Uh, we haven't anticipated that insulin resistant journey until you're you're literally seeing changes in your in your blood glucose levels over time. Um, but that is a general sort of marker that we use to to uh, average out your insulin your uh, glucose control over the preceding three months. Um, glucose tolerance tests, many people have probably already done them. This is where you ingest uh, a certain amount of glucose in the form of a drink, um, something around 75 grams. And then you, at regular intervals, test your glucose levels to uh, look at the response. Um, abnormal results that indicate high blood, glucose, gl high blood glucose levels after two hours uh, suggesting delayed clearance can indicate insulin resistance. But again, I think that's quite a late sign. Um, and C-peptide, this is a, a byproduct of insulin production. Um, measuring C-peptide levels can maybe help you evaluate your insulin uh, resistance by looking at it as a surrogate marker of how much insulin you are producing and therefore breaking down. Um, but again, it, I don't think any of these are uh, particularly useful for the individual. So you're getting a picture, hopefully, that it is really hard to figure out the, your level or your degree of insulin resistance. And it's more a case of, well, let's do all the things that we can do today to ensure that we are as insulin sensitive as possible. Do glucose monitors have an impact on changing one's behaviors to maintain insulin sensitivity. I don't think we have long enough studies to, to demonstrate that, but my anecdotal opinion is that probably probably would be um, useful as a tool for certain people who love learning a bit more about their analytics. Um, I, I personally think it's useful, but hey, what do I know? Um, the other thing I wanna make really clear is if all of those tests are negative, so let's say you do your all glucose tolerance test, you do your HbA1c, you do your triglycerides, you do your HDLC, you do all these all these different tests and they're all negative. That does not mean you have a clean bill of health. And I think this is something that we get very, very wrong in medicine. We assume incorrectly that if the tests are negative, if everything is within range, that's fine. You carry on, do what you do, you're, you're fine. And then we intervene very, very late. And along that journey of 10 to 15 years where someone is insulin resistant and their body is so adaptable, our bodies are so adaptable. If you think about it from the perspective of smoking, someone has to smoke for decades daily before they get a chronic pulmonary disorder or they have cardiovascular disease or they uh, have a stroke. That isn't to say 
that up to that point, that was first 20 years when they were smoking or however long it was, that they were healthy. No, it, it's, it's, it is exactly what we're doing with things like insulin resistance. We are intervening only at a very, very late stage whereby you have the, the uh, investigations that demonstrate changes in glucose uh, maintenance. And that, that for me is, you know, is, it's right at the end because your body is so, so adaptable and has this wonderful mechanism of, of uh, maintaining balance. So that's definitely something I want to make really, really clear. You get your investigations great, but it doesn't mean that you have a clean bill of health. There are some imaging studies that I think could be useful for people. Where and how, uh, how early they can demonstrate uh, insulin resistance is, is still up for question, I would say. Um, so the, the ones that I'm always asked about include uh, MRIs um, uh, or CT scans looking at visceral adipose tissue. Uh, ideally, you want, that, you want that to be as low as possible. Higher amounts of visceral fat are commonly associated with insulin resistance. So you want to make sure that's very low. Um, abdominal obesity, uh, so larger waist circumference, but you can very easily do that with a waist hip, uh, ratio. Um, but you can also do it on imaging as well. If you prefer to have it on imaging, so you can have before afters, uh, that's definitely something that could be again, a behavior, a behavioral change tool and give you sort of a range of as to where you are. Uh, and then DEXAs as well. So DEXAs are relatively cheap and accessible. I think you can get one for about 150 pounds now relatively um, uh, often as well. Um, it will give you an indication of your total body uh, fat percentage, um, particularly in the central region as well. That can be linked to insulin resistance. So those are two things that you could do or a simple ways to hit ratio that you keep an eye on, I think is, um, uh, is, is useful. So a combination of all those different investigations, you've got clinical evaluation that you can get done by your doctor you can uh, have all those different blood tests. You can have the imaging. I think that's nice to have. Um, these will give you some sort of uh, inkling as to where you are on the range of insulin resistance. Um, as you can tell, you know, it, 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 this I think is one of the problems that we have with insulin resistance that we don't really know how to measure it. Um, and I think once we find a reliable test that's easy, quick, sensitive and specific, I think it would be a real game changer for a lot of people. If you enjoyed that video, you will love the full episode on insulin resistance. You can click right here and it will take you to the full podcast.